So today we're going to look at the common drugs used in anaesthetics. It causes an undue amount of stress to new students and practitioners in the theatre complex when they're asked to explain what certain drugs do and how they act. This short guide is perfect for the new and old practitioner alike who want a summary view of all the main drugs we use in the anaesthetic department and in intensive care. As always, you should check doses with your local policies and formularies. On the top of the anaesthetic trolley in theatre, we have labels that we put on our drug syringes to differentiate them from one another. Let's go through. Thiopental or thiopentone is a thiobarbitate which is presented as a yellow powder in 500 mg per vial. You normally give 3 to 7 mg per kilogram as an IV induction agent which means it puts the patient to sleep. A single bolus dose used to put the patient to sleep will last about 5 or 10 minutes. It can be used to treat status epilepticus or to achieve burst suppression in patients with raised intracranial pressure. It might cause an increased heart rate, it will drop your cardiac output and it will drop your systemic vascular resistance which means you become more vasodilated. So the next drug down we see is ketamine and ketamine is used as an IV induction agent as well. It's also used as an analgesic. It's what's known as a fencyclidine derivative and it was originally developed in the late 1970s for the Vietnam War. It is given as 1 to 2 mg per kilogram for IV induction of anaesthesia or as an analgesic dose of 0.2 to 0.5 mg per kilogram. The interesting and often positive aspect of ketamine is that it increases your noradrenaline and adrenaline release in the body, therefore increasing your heart rate, increasing your cardiac output, increasing your blood pressure, it also increases your cardiac oxygen consumption, increases your respiratory rate um, and it also gives bronchodilation which is of excellent use in asthma. So as you can see from those characteristics, you might want to choose this anaesthetic for somebody who is sick, hypotensive uh, or a trauma patient. It's not very similar to any of the other induction agents, it's actually known as a dissociative anaesthetic and there's more information on this on the website. We've already looked at midazolam in another one of our videos but it's a benzodiazepine. It works near the GABA receptor in the body and provides good sedation and anxiolysis. It's normally given intravenously at a dose of 0.02 to 0.1 milligrams per kilogram and that's for sedation. Some of the lesser known drugs now, glycoparolate is an anticholinergic drug, it's actually an anti-muscarinic drug and it's used in anaesthesia to increase the heart rate uh, a little bit. Uh, if you were looking to increase the heart rate more you would use atropine, it's also an anticholinergic. And in an emergency setting a 3 milligram dose of atropine would successfully block the vagus nerve uh, stopping its action on the heart. That is because the vagus nerve when it acts on the heart causes a, a profound bradycardia so if you stop its effect it will cause non-opposed tachycardia. Adrenaline is a naturally occurring catecholamine. It's an alpha and beta agonist and basically it's used either as an infusion in intensive care at 0.01 to 0.1 micrograms per kilogram per minute or as one milligram IV in the ALS protocol, but only for the arrested patient. It can also be used in anaphylaxis in a one in 1,000 concentration, and that's given intramuscularly, not intravenously. Adrenaline, when used at low doses, will have more beta effects and alpha effects. It will increase your cardiac output, increase your cardiac oxygen consumption. It's a coronary artery vasodilator. It will drop your diastolic blood pressure and decrease your peripheral vascular resistance. At higher doses we see the alpha effects predominate and that increases your systemic vascular resistance, thus increasing preload to the heart and increasing your blood pressure even more. It's a very potent bronchodilator and it used to be used in asthma an awful lot more in the emergent setting before the advent of beta 2 agonists like salbutamol. Ephedrine is an alpha and beta agonist and basically what it does is it's an indirect sympathomimetic, i.e. it causes release of noradrenaline from nerve terminals. It will also have a directly stimulating effect on the alpha and beta receptors. Ephedrine causes an increase in heart rate, an increase in cardiac output, an increase in blood pressure, an increase in coronary artery blood flow and increased myocardial oxygen consumption. It also facilitates bronchodilation and increases your respiratory rate. Phenylephrine is an alpha-1 agonist. It has absolutely no effect on the beta receptors and will cause an increase in systemic vascular resistance via vasoconstriction. This will increase your blood pressure due to increased preload to the heart and therefore might cause a reflex bradycardia. Metaraminol is a potent sympathomimetic amine. It gives direct stimulation of the alpha-1 and some beta receptors. The alpha effects predominate, however. It will increase your systemic vascular resistance, increase your blood pressure, increase your coronary artery blood flow, increase your pulmonary artery pressure and your pulmonary vascular resistance. It will also increase your respiratory rate and your tidal volumes. In contrast to phenylephrine that will last about 5 to 10 minutes, metaraminol will last for about an hour, between 20 minutes and 60 minutes. Oxytocin is a synthetic posterior pituitary hormone. It's a bit like ADH. It works by stimulating uterine contraction and that's done by binding to specific sites in the muscle cells. It's obviously used to cause uterine contraction and therefore is used in the induction of labour by midwifery and obstetric staff. It's also used following caesarean section to clamp down the uterus to stop bleeding. Muscle relaxants are a wide variety of drugs used to paralyse the patient after IV induction and they're asleep. 
This facilitates tracheal intubation and surgery. Most of these drugs are non-depolarizing muscle relaxants and what they do is provide competitive inhibition of acetylcholine at nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction. They bind to alpha subunits of the receptor, therefore blocking it and making it unable to cause a muscular contraction. Most of the drugs in this class are non-depolarizing muscle blockers and we'll cover this in a separate video. But examples of them include rocuronium, vacuronium, mevacurium, cisatracurium and atracurium. Most of these drugs, depending on dose, are slower than the depolarizing muscle relaxant succimethonium. Succimethonium has a very rapid onset and because it causes chaotic depolarization of the muscle, you will see fasciculations before flaccid paralysis. These fasciculations can be used as an endpoint to tell the anaesthetist when it is time to intubate the patient. Neostigmine, often combined with glycopyronium, is a reversal agent that increases acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. The glycopyrrolate is added as it increases the heart rate because neostigmine decreases the heart rate, so kind of they offset each other. Dexamethasone is used to treat nausea and vomiting. It is a potent steroid and it's an anti-emetic. Ondansetron is an anti-emetic drug that works at the 5-HT3 receptors. The 5-HT receptors are located in the chemoreceptor trigger zone and whenever they are blocked they stop the impulses from the chemoreceptor trigger zone going to the vomiting centre. Anti-emetics are a large topic, so don't worry we have a video for that as well. Remifentanil is an ultra-fast acting opioid. It's normally given in theatre as an analgesic for surgical stimulus or in the intensive care unit for the patients who are intubated to give them tube tolerance. One of the great benefits of remifentanil is whenever you stop the infusion, and it's always given as an infusion, is that the effects stop very shortly afterwards, within a couple of minutes. Fentanyl is a short-acting potent opioid. We normally give it at the start of anaesthetic to blunt the response whenever we look into the patient's mouth with a laryngoscope. Alfentanyl is a very short-acting opioid and is less potent than fentanyl. We use it almost in the same way as fentanyl, just the doses are a bit different and it will wear off in a shorter space of time, so it's used in shorter cases. Or whenever you're looking to provide cover analgesia for short periods during intense surgical stimulation. It'll normally wear off within about 10 or 15 minutes in comparison to fentanyl that normally lingers for about half an hour to 45 minutes. Hopefully none of you will need an introduction to morphine, which is the gold standard opiate we use. Um, it will last for about 3 to 5 hours and is normally given in incrementing doses between 0 and 10 milligrams. Levobupivacaine is a long-acting amide local anaesthetic. It's used whenever we're doing nerve blocks or regional anaesthetics in theatre. Lidocaine is a short-acting amide local anaesthetic. It's used for skin and other localised procedures. Levobupivacaine takes a longer time to work than lidocaine and all local anaesthetics are sodium channel blockers. Tranexamic acid has become very fashionable lately. It's an anti-fibrinolytic drug, so this stops clot breakdown and is used in certain operations like trauma, orthopaedic theatres, and in general surgical cases where the patient's described as a bit oozy so and is losing blood. Essentially, it is the opposite of alteplase, which is a drug used in stroke thrombolysis. Paracoxib is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that is specific to COX-2, so it exerts its anti-inflammatory effects by inhibiting COX-2, that also gives its analgesic effect. So the rest of the drugs we're going to cover now are all antibiotics. So benzalpanicillin is a beta-lactam antibiotic and it's good against gram-positive organisms. Unfortunately, a lot of bacteria now are resistant to benzalpanicillin. And so cefiroxime is a second generation cephalosporin drug. It's broad spectrum and is active against gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. Interestingly enough, it crosses the blood-brain barrier unlike other second generation cephalosporin. Comoxiclav is a combination of amoxicillin and clavulanic acid. It's a beta-lactam mixed with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Beta-lactamase is basically one of the things produced by bacteria which causes resistance. Gentamicin is a very common aminoglycoside prescribed in the hospital. It's excellent against gram-negative infections such as those that cause urinary tract infections. Finally, flucloxacillin is also a beta-lactam like benzalpenicillin. It's good against gram-positive organisms such as those that cause skin infections. And how could we forget propofol? So propofol is an IV induction agent, and I think as our namesake it warrants a special mention. It's probably the most commonly used induction agent in the Western world for routine surgery. It is presented as a very characteristic white lipid solution that has a rapid onset and a fairly quick offset too. It is given as 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams per kilogram for the IV induction of anesthesia. When you're giving it, it's important to realise that it'll cause a decreased blood pressure and stroke volume, probably by about 15 to 25%. It'll decrease your cardiac output by about 25%. It'll cause vasodilation secondary to nitric oxide production, and all this can cause a bradycardia, and in some severe cases, if it's given, if it's given incorrectly, will cause asystole. Propofol will cause respiratory depression, and one of the good effects of it is that it decreases your laryngeal reflex whenever we're looking with the laryngoscope. It'll increase your respiratory but drop your tidal volume and it will decrease the response that your body has to increased levels of CO2 and hypoxia. 
It's also a bronchodilator, but not as profound as ketamine. Interestingly, it has antiemetic properties, probably because of its role at the 5-HT3 receptor, and is used in the treatment of refractory post-operative nausea and vomiting. So that was an extremely quick whirlwind tour of the commonly used anaesthetic drugs. We're going to be going over all these drugs again in later videos and even in previous videos. But this video was made to give you an insight into all the different sorts of drugs we use in anaesthetics and intensive care. Uh, so you can stop being scared of them and know basically what they do.